The story is about Saul who has slain the Amalekites, but he did not commit all the way. There was an intention there of starting out, I am going to follow God's command, wipe out all the Amalekites. The Amalekites represent our flesh, our sins that we struggle with. But there was something that held him back that he couldn't commit to. And we will discover these in these following verses. Verse 1, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Look at verse 7. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to shore, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. I want to cover from this passage how this man heard the word of the Lord, got convicted, and he even committed to follow God's word after he heard from the preacher. But he didn't follow through his commitment. In his action of trying to follow God's command, it even sounded like he utterly destroyed the things of the flesh. That's what the wording said. With a small exception that made him still not commit. It sounds like a lot of us generally, and I hope that this sermon will speak to your heart. Will you pray with me? Father, fill within me Holy Spirit power, the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What kind of a sermon can follow up after summer camp that can minister to these people who did come, and at the same time minister to people who didn't come? I pray that your message, your Holy Spirit, will be all over this Please. and that you'll convict and change each and every heart. I just want to help. I want to help, Lord. You know my heart. Please, May Lord. the people see I just want to help these people. Yes. No matter uh, how hard or rough it comes out, may it turn into something that they'll truly feel actually uplifted, yes. Father, uplifted and changed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Now, I will not read verse 1 through 3 because I already read it. But the first thing I want you to discover from verses 1 through 3 is that Saul heard the word of the Lord. You'll notice right here, Samuel said, Therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the Lord. Meaning then that the Lord and Samuel took it that when Saul heard the word of the Lord, they knew Saul would take it seriously. If Saul didn't commit to the word of the Lord, when he heard the word of the Lord, if Saul was thinking, no, it's just one year out the other. Well, I'm not really sure. Um, well, maybe I'll follow this much, but not this. No, I don't think Saul had that in his heart. I think when Saul heard the commandment of the word of the Lord, he meant it and he was serious and he was going to commit to the command. You might say, why is that? The reason why is because at verse 1, why would Samuel and the Lord say, hearken to the voice of the Lord? Because they knew that he would hearken. They knew that he would take it seriously. Another thing is at verse 1, the Bible says the Lord set anointed Saul, anointed Saul to follow his command. If he knew that Saul was a wishy-washy type, why would he anoint him? to do the task, right? So the Lord knew that Saul would take it seriously. Another thing is when you look at verse 11, verse 11, God repented for anointing Saul to carry out the task. Why did God repent? Because he later saw that Saul changed his commitment, that Saul wouldn't follow through with God's command. Meaning then that the Lord the reason why he repented, why would he repent unless the Lord thought of Saul as I anointed him to wipe out the Amalekites? See, because the Lord took it as he will wipe out the Amalekites. That's why I anointed him. But later on, Saul didn't. So the Lord said, I changed my mind. I repent. 
So we have to understand here, both the Lord and Samuel realized that when the word of God was preached to Saul, verses 1, 2, and 3, look at all that. That's the word of the Lord, right? right. They knew Saul took that seriously. So Saul committed to that. As a matter of fact, if you look at verse 4, Saul was carrying on the action. Verse 4, And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telaim. See, when you hear the preaching of the word of God, you put it into action. Saul didn't have it in his mind at that time to rebel. Saul didn't have it in his mind at that time when he committed to action that I'm going to disobey the Lord or with this exception. No, I believe he had it in his heart to fully carry on the command of God. I believe that. I believe that. The evidence also is when you look at verse 6, verse 6. Saul said to the Kenites, you better get out because I'm going to wipe out everything. Yeah. See, Saul had it full intention to wipe out everything. But later on, we know that he fell. Why is it that he fell later on? Well, uh, we do know this. The difference with why he was committed at the beginning and why he was not committed later on, the clear difference is the word of the Lord being preached to him. And what makes a full difference is that when the word of the Lord is preached to you, then what happens is you're stirred up to commit to that action. But five days later, after hearing the word of the Lord in a Sunday sermon, what happens? You change. You're not committed. Why? You don't hear the word of the Lord preached to you. Why is it that on a Sunday preaching, you commit to the Lord, but then come Friday, you don't? The huge difference is you hear the word of the Lord preached to you. Why do you think daily Bible reading is important? You need the word of the Lord preached to you because you cannot survive staying committed to God, getting victory over your sin and your weaknesses by skipping Bible reading. You need to be surrounded in that. You know how you get someone to commit to a certain action? When you get them in the mood for it. How can you get them in the mood for it if you don't give them the word of God? Right. You know why you're able to commit right now in the preaching? You're in the mood for it. Yeah. Why are you in the mood for it? The word of God preached created that mood. Right. Yes. Don't you think that you should, you know, when I do my Bible reading, I changed it to where I just don't read it in the morning or I end it at night. I read it consistently. Yeah even broken pieces. You might say, why do you do that, Pastor? I want to get in the mood for the Word of God. I pray to the Lord, pray without ceasing, not just a specific time. You might say, why? Because I want to get myself in the mood for it. By immersing and dunking myself in the mood of the Word of God and prayer, the Holy Spirit is constantly in my thoughts and maybe sometimes in my feelings, and that helps me better to stay committed to the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. But when you go five hours without the Word of God, what happens to your mood, to your flesh? That's why you don't stay committed. You know what would make the difference with Saul? Is if he constantly probably had Samuel right next to him preaching the Word of the Lord as he conquered the Amalekites. Maybe that would have made the difference. Yeah. You know what you should do? Keep that book open. Keep your mouth open in prayer. I mean, constantly hear so many different Bible-believing preachers. Go back through the sermons that we have even online so that you can go through it. Never skip a church service. That's the most dangerous thing. That's the best thing that sets you in the mood. Above, believe it or not, Bible reading and prayer. Fellowship puts you in that mood of yes. spirituality. Don't skip. Keep yourself into it. Why? Because that way you can stay committed to the work of the Lord. Without that environment, without that mood, how can you go five hours after hearing the word of the Lord? Yeah. Some of you fall immediately after one hour from yes. hearing the word of the Lord. Make it constant in your heart. That's why when you quote Bible verses during temptation, it helps. Why? You're setting the mood yeah. of the word of God That's when you really quote good. scripture verses. Where are your memory verses? Where are your memory verses? Why don't you study the Bible? Put yourself, dunk yourself in that environment, that mood. That will make you stay committed. You don't have to wait one year later for summer camp. Carry summer camp with you. 
Take those experiences with you. Put that every day. Hear the preaching. Recall, meditate on those experiences. Put yourself in the mood. Fill yourself up with the word of God. Yes. That'll help you stay committed if you create that mood. That mood. You know, if we look at verse 4, 5, and 6, the Bible says that Saul, he put it into action. He gathered the people. He numbered them at verse 4. Verse 5, he was coming to the city of Amalek, laid wait in the valley. He's going to wipe them out. Verse 6, this is really good. He told the Kenites, you better get out of here because I'm going to wipe out everything. If you don't get out, you're going to be wiped out. Meaning that Saul had the full intentions, I am going to commit and follow through by wiping out the Amalekites. That's a picture of a Christian who had the full intention, setting up, preparing plans, gathering the people, numbering the people, laying wait in the valley, ready to attack sin. The Amalekites, picture your flesh, picture your idols, picture your sins. And you have the full intention to carry out the plan. But just prepping doesn't mean you obeyed the word of the Lord. Right. Yeah. Just doing it doesn't even mean that you obeyed the word of the Lord. Preach. You might say, why? Sacrificing, giving up some of your issues doesn't mean you obey the word of the Lord. You might say, why is that? Because it's not how you begin, it's how you finish. It's not what you're doing now, it's by how you finish it. So you, you know why Saul didn't commit? He was thinking only about doing it, or starting it, or prepping for it, but he wasn't thinking about finishing it. You know how you stay committed if you're struggling with the same sin problem? You got that certain weakness you need to conquer. You need to overcome the trial, the suffering, and you need to stay committed to serving the Lord, doing your spiritual duties. You know what will help you follow through? Not just, I got to do it, but as you're doing it, you got to say, I'm not done yet. Yeah. I want to finish this. Yes. As you're doing the work of the Lord, you can't just think, I'm doing it. you got to think, I want to finish this. I must finish this. It ain't over till the fat lady sings. <laughs> it's not done. It's not like I've done the work for you, Lord, until you finish it. Yeah. If you have that in your mind as you're doing the work of the Lord, then you can be at peace. Then you can say, oh, I've Amen. done my soul winning for the day when you finished your soul winning for the day. Right. Not beginning to, I set my alarm for soul winning that day. I put the gas in my tank and the pastor said, this address, I got it. I got the tracks in my pocket. I memorized the verses. Okay, I'm ready to do. No, 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 that's not. That's not proving that you've done your soul winning for the day. Yeah. It's after visitation is over and you already passed out the tracks and you already opened your mouth in witnessing, did you accomplish your job? It's by you finish. It's by how you finish, not by what you do. That's good. By how you finish. Keep that in your mind. As you're committed to the work of the Lord, you know why you keep falling back to the same temptation? You always stop midway. No matter how serious you start, serious you prepare, like Saul. He prepared seriously. He started seriously. He told the Kenites, I'm going to wipe out everything. That was like after hearing the preaching of the word of God, after his altar call and said, I'm going to do it. But he still disobeyed God. He didn't follow through. Why? He was thinking about, I intend to do this. No, not intend to do this. I must finish this. I'm not done yet. After altar call, you know what you need to do when you go back home? Not, I got the victory. Yeah. You got to go, I can't wait to get back so I can finish this. Yeah, that's right. I must finish this. You know why you keep falling back to the same problem? You only come here and you think that you forsake the sin and the idol just at an altar. No, that's just the beginning. When you come here, you got to go, when you go back to your seat, I got work to do at home that I need to finish. Yes. Finish. If you have that in your mind, finish, finish, you will finish it. That's how you stay committed. Another thing to notice is when you look at verse 7 and 8 and 9. Isn't that interesting? 
The, the Holy Spirit, the author writes, as if Saul did his job. It sounds like he did his job. You might say, how so? Look at the wording here. Smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur. Whoa, look at that. He was conquering his flesh all the way from one location to a faraway distance. He was working so hard. He was committed. He was serious for the Lord to kill that flesh, the Amalekites. Verse 8. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. Now that's the part where we see he failed. But look how the author writes. It doesn't sound that serious. Because it's drowned by the context of verse 7. He killed the Amalekites from, from Havilah all the way to Shur. And he, verse 8, utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Doesn't that sound like he's committed? Yeah. You, uh, I know you're looking at he took the king of uh, Agag, the king of the Amalekites alive. I know you're paying attention to that for his disobedience. But when you look at the whole context, it sounds like he's committed. If you look at verse 9, it sounds like he's committed. He spared Agag, the best of sheep, oxen, fatling, lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. But, look at this, but everything that was vile and refused, that they utterly destroyed. Oh, but Saul spared the animals, pastor. But look at that, it says that he only spared that was good. He utterly destroyed that was what? Wicked, yeah. vile, refuse. Overall, I think he's a committed man. Doesn't that what it sounds like? Yeah. I mean, uh, you might say, why are, you, uh, why are you not paying attention to those certain words, Pastor? He spared Agag. He spared the animals. I know, I know. But if you look at the overall tone, it said he utterly destroyed. He was killing them from Havilah to Shur. He went so far away and he destroyed. That was vile and refused. Wicked. Yeah. Sounds like a committed Christian to me. Why? Why did he still disobey God? Because you're paying attention to those minor areas. Right. He spared Agag. He spared the good of the flock. That's why. Well, then why don't you think that way with your Christian walk? You know what your problem is? You're looking at the overall tone of how you carried out your work for the Lord. I destroyed that was wicked, Father. Vile refused. I went from Havilah to Shur. I went so many days and weeks defeating that sin. I utterly destroyed everything in my life. I know Agag. I know those animals, but they're so minor. Overall, I committed. What, why do you make a big deal about that? I think I'm pretty much a good Christian. That's what you do. That's what you do. That's why you think that you're right with God. Why? Because the things that you spared are good, not wicked. What do you mean, Pastor? Did you look at that verse? What he spared at verse 9? The animals, all that was what? Good. He wouldn't destroy that's good. But vile and refuse, he destroyed. You know why you always don't follow through your commitment? It's because you won't destroy that which is good in your life. You only destroy that which is evil to you. You might say, why is that, Pastor? For example, you might say that, okay, I destroyed uh, this sin and that sin. I got uh, rid of, uh, you know, those drugs in my life. I trash it. I disposed of it, you know. So, Pastor, I destroyed all that was wicked in my life. Ah, but you don't destroy that which is good. You might say, what is that? It could be the good thing in your life, which is you don't think is a serious thing. It could be your work. That's not evil. It's your work. But as you're around that work, you know that's where your temptation always started with drugs or certain yeah. things you're struggling with. Because during break time, here are your coworkers doing this yeah. or yeah. doing this. Wrong. Getting you connected with the wrong people again. Yeah. Yeah. You need to destroy that which is good, not just wicked. That's why you don't follow through your commitment in overcoming your drug addiction. What about uh, church attendance? You might go, oh yeah, I commit to church and I destroyed everything vile and wicked in my life that will prevent me from coming to church. I dispose my sin, pastor. I dispose my laziness. I, dispo I dispose the things of the flesh that would prevent me from coming to church. 
Okay, great, praise the Lord, but then it's someone in your home. They're not evil. They're good. Your spouse, your children, your family. Nothing evil about them. But because you're bound to them on something, you skip church. That's why your commitment doesn't follow through with attending church. It's getting quiet in here. You know what I'm trying to point at? What I'm trying to point at is if you want to stay committed to the work of the Lord, you got to open your eyes and see it's not the evil things. It's not just the evil things that are holding me back from committing. It's also the good things in my life. You know what Jesus said about good things? If you don't hate your father, mother, brother, sister, your own life, also you cannot be my disciple. Because the good thing, oh, it's my family. What's wrong with them? Sometimes they could gossip, poison your mind. Oh, yeah. And then you yeah. think wrongly about the brothers and sisters in Christ, the church, and the preaching of the word of God. Why? Because they're not evil. They're good. Yeah. That's why you don't follow through your commitment for the Lord. Preach. There are good things in your life. Busyness, work, finances. Maybe even your brothers and sisters in Christ. Good things. You know how you discover those good things? I know, if you don't pay attention. As you're doing your commitment work for God, catch yourself why you fell behind that day. Okay. Why you skipped that day. That's good. Is it because of something wicked and evil? No. It could be something that's very good and understandable. Okay. I'm too tired. I'm too busy. God would understand. I just can't do it that day. The brethren will understand why I can't come that day. It's... Look, you think that something wicked in your life will prevent you from following through your commitment to God? No, it's also the good things if you look back. It's always been a good thing, not an evil thing, but a good thing that, helped, that held you back from following through God. And some of you need to dismantle those relationships, dismantle those attachments, yeah. dismantle those things you're so preoccupied in yeah. that are good. That's why you don't co your commitment doesn't follow through. How do, how do you know that, Pastor? You know why I skip my spiritual duty? It's always something good, not bad. That's why I know. You need to utterly destroy that which is good in your life when you discover it. Do you catch it? Some of you aren't catching it. And if you're not catching it, you know what's going to happen? I'll tell you what will happen if you don't catch it. You're deceived. And you're going to think that, the re that you're committed for the Lord. I utterly destroyed. I went from Havilah to Shur and I destroyed everything vile and refused. And you're going to think that your walk with Jesus Christ is okay. Come on, preach. Your walk with other Bible-believing Christians here is okay. Wow. That's what's going to happen. You're going to deceive yourself. And I'm going to show you, it gets worse. It's going to get harder after this. So if you want to leave, now would be a good time to leave, actually, because it's going to get more convicting. Look at verse 10 through 12. 10 through 12, God speaks to Samuel, saying, I repent. I shouldn't have set up Saul to be king. He disobeyed me. And Samuel grieved and cried to the Lord all night. And then verse 12, Samuel was grieving, but what was Saul doing? Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. It was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. This uh, selfish person wouldn't even weep over his own sin because he's too blind to see it. While, his, while the prophet Samuel is mourning for him all night. Praying for him. Man, how tragic. You ever did that for your loved one? You ever grieved for your loved one? Yeah. You ever prayed for your loved one? You ever yeah. said, Lord, I'll open that person's eye. I don't get it. Why won't they see their need of Jesus Christ, that they're lost, that they're deceived by a wrong doctrine? Yeah. And you've been praying and you've been grieving all night and going on and on and on while that loved one of yours is going from Carmel to Gilgal, like Saul, just minding their own business and they don't even they're so blind they don't even see their sin 
and they're laughing, they're enjoying their sin and poking fun at you. Doesn't that grieve you? That's tragic, isn't it? Well, my friend, if you understand that, why can't you see that with your fellow brethren here who have been praying and grieving for you, who've been trying to encourage you, who try to fellowship with you, set up something to stir you up, but you're just going from Carmel and Gilgal doing your own thing, too blind to see your sin. Tragic. Tragic. And how does that happen? You go back. You go back. It's not because you fail to destroy that which is vile. You fail to destroy that which is good. It goes back to there. It goes back to there. Continuing on, verse 13. Look at, this is, I don't get, how can Saul be this stupid, all right? Look at verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, You say this? Blessed be thou the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Yeah. No, you didn't, Saul. Look, look, at it, look at his blindness. Look what Samuel says at verse 14. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Samuel says, Hey, no, you didn't obey the commandment of the Lord. What's all that sheep and cow behind you? You know how stupid Saul is? He had that whole train behind him. It should be so plain to see that he didn't obey the commandment of the Lord, but he's so blind that he thinks that he did it. He is unashamed if Samuel sees all of that. Wow. It gets worse. You know how Saul responds? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, where the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Look at that answer. You know what Saul said? He didn't say, I disobeyed God because. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I did wrong because. No, he didn't even say that. You know what he said? About this oxen and sheep behind him. He thought Samuel would understand why he would spare them. I spared them because they're a great sacrifice to God. Samuel, you'll be pleased with what I did. This is even worse. Verse 16, Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And you know how Saul responds? Uh-oh. No, that's not what he says. He doesn't go, uh-oh. You know what he said? Say on. You know what that means? Amen. That's what amen means. It means to say on. I agree. Go ahead, keep telling me. Is Saul stupid? You know what his problem is? His problem is this. He thinks he committed. He's doing a good work for the Lord. His service and walk with God is okay. But Saul, you spared Agag, you spared the oxen. You know what he turned that into? They're not vile. They're not refused. They're good. So because they're good, Samuel, you will understand why I spared them. You know why you don't follow your commitment through with the Lord and you still disobey him? You spare that which is good. And that good thing held you back from serving God and you know it. But when you're confronted with that, you have no shame. And you think that, no, no, these are good things. I didn't disobey God. My service for Jesus Christ is good. God will understand why I spared those good things. Why I keep those good things. Why I let those good things hold me back from fully following the command of God. God will understand why I spared them. Well, what if God's going to judge you for that, the judgment seat of Christ? You have full confidence on that? You got a clean conscience on that? You know what some of you will say? Say on. Oh, wow. That's good. You don't believe me? I believe that's the case. When that pride blinds you so much, and when you rationalize your fail failures with God so much, you become confident that this is something that I'm right with God, so if God were to ask me at the judgment seat of Christ, go ahead, Lord. I have my explanations ready. You will understand what I did was right. Wow, that's really good, Pastor. 
Say on. Amen. You know what some of you are doing? Amen. 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 And you're so blind, you don't even see the thing that's holding you back from serving God. You're only looking at the vile, the refuse. Yeah, That's why you're going, amen, amen, amen. When you say amen, are you like Saul so blind you're not seeing that good thing that's been holding you back from serving God? That's a hard sermon, right? I told you. I told you you would really love it if you like hard preaching or you would really hate it. I've done God's command. I'm ready for the judgment seat of God. I serve God. If you're not careful, my friend, that good thing's been holding you back, but you don't let those good things bother you. You think those good things God would understand. I give them as a sacrifice for you, God. It's because I got to feed my family. It's because I got to make money. It's because it's done for your glory, Lord. Do you know how many people will give that excuse at the judgment seat of Christ? Why'd you do that? Because I did it for you, Lord. I did it for your glory, for your glory. And God said, same old story. I'm sick and tired of hearing that. Do you know how many false preachers think they're doing the work of the Lord right now? Yeah, yeah. And they're going to say to God, I did it for you, Lord. I did it for your glory. You know, the contemporary Christian music. Oh, I'm singing to this contemporary beat because I'm doing it for you, Lord. It's from my heart and all that stuff. And God, it's for your glory, for your glory. And God says, no. People get blinded by that, by the deeds of the flesh. The, the dressing, the outward appearance of dressing where it's so immodest, people think, they quote scripture, they said, man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. The marijuana, oh, you know, uh, Jesus drank wine, and how can people end up like that? You know why? They fried their brains. Come on, and they kept seeing them as good things, good things, good things. That if God were to ask me that question at the judgment seat of Christ, I have full confidence that I am innocent still of this. Say on. Amen. Look at verse 17. 17. You know what Samuel says? You know, when thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners and the Amalekites and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and dis evil in the sight of the Lord? When Samuel rebukes Saul, listen, when Samuel rebukes Saul, tells him specifically his problem. You disobeyed because you failed to do this specific thing. When he rebukes him personally, and when he tells him his specific sin problem, you know what Saul says at verse 20? And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. He doesn't say I have sinned until verses later. You know what he insists? He insists, yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have, oh, come on, are you a moron? And have brought Agag, the king of Amalek. Did you, did you read that? Is that what your King James Bible said? Let's read it, okay? He said at verse 20, have, I have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek. You know what he said? Contradiction. I've gone the way of the Lord and brought King Amalek. No, you did not go the way of the Lord if you spared Agag, the king of Amalek. And have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took up the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things, which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. What's the matter with this brain, man? The, yeah, 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 the sheep, oxen should be destroyed. As a sacrifice to the Lord. Yeah. Wow. You know how that happens? That happens from sparing that good thing in your life. Okay. You know one thing I learned? And I'm talking about myself here, all right? Because I know human nature. It's one thing, it's one thing where you hear the preaching of the word of God and you surrender that sin and you realize you're wrong. But it's totally different when, listen, 
What if it was a one-on-one -on -one rebuke? Why did you do that thing? Why did you skip serving God that day? Why did you skip that specific duty? Why did you uh, say that certain thing? Why did you see that certain thing? Why did I see you do that that particular day? When you're confronted one-on-one, -on -one, rebuked one-on-one, -on -one, it's very different. You know specifically what that person's pointing out to be a problem, and then the defense mechanism kicks in, and you insist, I have done the work of the Lord. I've obeyed God. Even though I slipped up in this thing that you said, I have obeyed the, oh, I have gone the way of the Lord. Or you also say, well, the reason why I fail to do that when you're confronted one-on-one, -on -one, the reason why I fail to do that is because, and then you give an excuse, but the people, you give a reason. I was busy, I was sick, I couldn't do this, I was tired, you know, you got to understand, my family's falling apart, breaking in half, and... Was that too deep for you, or you want me to break it down a little more? If I were to preach against your sin, your failure, in this sermon, you don't get it. Yeah. But it's different if I went to you 101 yeah, right. and told you your sin and failure, then it's going to click in your head. It's going to click in your head, and you're gonna, you can't say amen this time. You can't say say on. The defense mechanism kicks in. And you insist that you're right, that you obey the voice of the Lord, even though you did that contradictory thing. And you're going to give your good reason, your excuse. I did it because the people yeah. sacrificed to the Lord. I did it because I, wow. I couldn't do it. I was just too weak, and I'm a baby. You don't know what I've been through in my life, my beginnings. I have a traumatic experience, and, you know, the flesh is all around me. I'm in an ungodly environment. Preacher, pray for me, and that's what happens. That's what happens. That's why you don't stay committed. Do you understand? The depths of your heart is revealed now. The reason why you don't stay committed is because, one, you're not rebuked 101. You don't take preaching as if it's rebuking you 101. Come on. Like, Come on. this is me. This is my specific problem. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. You don't take it like that. If you take it like that, then your eyes will be opened a bit. That's real good. Secondly, you insist you're in the right for the Lord, even though you're doing something contradictory. That's your problem. That second thing's got to get out of the way. The third thing is you got to stop putting a blame on the environment, on your flesh, on your birth, on other people, on other things. You got to stop using them as your excuse. Yeah. Then you can commit to the Lord. Okay. That's good. If you don't fix these three things, you will, that's why you ne you're never committed to the Lord. And every blowout preaching, and I don't care if it's the best preaching in the world, you're going to be like Saul, so blind you can't even see it, and you're going to go, say on. Yeah. You'll be that fool on the altar saying, amen. Look at 1 Samuel 15 again. 1 Samuel 15. Look at verse 22 through 23. You know what Samuel said? Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings? Obedience is better than sacrifice. And verse 23, Samuel accuses Saul of witchcraft. Come on, Samuel, you're too hard, don't you think so? It's not like Saul said, I'm going to put a pentagram in my hand, do witchcraft, and come on, Samuel, you're too extreme. Look at Saul, he had a good heart. He sacrificed much to the Lord. I mean, he utterly destroyed the Amalekites. He went from Havilah to Shur. He worked so hard. I mean, he even told the Kenites, I'm going to wipe them all out. I mean, he's, he destroyed that was vile and refused. Come on, Samuel. Come on. I mean, that little thing, man. Come on, what's the big deal about that? That's used as a sacrifice to the Lord. How can you accuse him of being a witch after that? That's pretty extreme, right? Well, 
Here's something interesting. Didn't Saul commit witchcraft later? He sure did. As a matter of fact, you know what that verse said at 1 Samuel chapter, I think, 29 or 28? You know what it said? Because you spared the Amalekites, that's why the Lord did this thing to you where you ended up in witchcraft. Wow. You don't have to believe me. You can look at that verse and find out. That's good. You know what the idea is? Listen, listen. It's not like that I can... Uh, if people keep messing up, they fail their commitment to God, that I can say to you, you're just lazy, that's your problem. No, that's just too extreme. But, listen, as time passes by, and when you failed your duty for the Lord, you're going to find out the deeper root issue was, after all, laziness. You are just lazy. Come on. Well, I'm not lazy. Look at me. I'm sacrificing so hard. I'm working so hard. I'm juggling things in my schedule. You don't know what you're talking about. How dare you? I'm trying to keep my family in order, keep up with the finances, and how can I do my Bible reading and prayer and all this kind of stuff? Hey, hey, hey. Your sacrifice is hiding your deeper issue. Do you realize that? Saul used his sacrifice of a lineup of oxen and sheep to hide the deeper issue that he would end up in, witchcraft. If you're not careful, my friend, you're that person who thinks that you sacrifice so much for Jesus Christ because you're a Bible believer and you compare yourselves. It always helps you to think you're a good Christian when you compare yourselves with other Christians, when you compare yourselves with other Bible believers in the room, when you try to find faults and weaknesses in your brother, sister in Christ, in the pastor, <laughs> somebody else, and that's always used as a cloak to see I'm more spiritual than them, so you... I sacrifice more for the Lord, and that's hiding the real sin that's about to come out of your life. Come on. Good. Maybe we're going to have to face the fact that you are in danger of laziness, that you are in danger of suicide if you're not careful, come on. that you're in danger of splitting the church, betraying people, that you are in danger of hating someone, that you are in danger of witchcraft, maybe. Why? Because sacrifice hides the deeper issue. Okay. Is that what you're doing right now? Is that what you're doing right now? Look at right here at verse 24. Now Saul says, I have sinned at verse 24, right? What a clear difference from verse 20. Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. No. Now 24, I have sinned. I have transgressed. Okay, praise the Lord. Now he can be forgiven, right? Verse 24, 25. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. Great, wonderful. There's one key thing you want to note. I preached a sermon on this long ago, but this is one of the most important things. Saul reveals the key thing, what made him change his mind. He originally was committed, right? He was going to follow through God's command, right? He said, I intend to do it. What made him change all of a sudden? Right here, right here. Verse 24, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words because what? I feared the people. Two things here. Two things, what is it? Fear, the feelings of his flesh. The people, the environment surrounding him, the world. That's what made him change. You know what will make you change your commitment so fast? The feelings of your flesh, because they're so unpredictable. When you get the preaching of the word of God, your feelings are in that mood, right? In a serious mood, in commitment. But when you get out of preaching, the mood changes. The feelings change. You feel heavy, groggy, grumpy, tired, you know, craving for sin, etc. Depressed. Feelings change your commitment. Yeah. At the same time, it's a deadly combination. Not just the feelings of your flesh, but your environment. Yes. 
Come on, when you go back to your home, you can say your environment's really good, really. Come on, preach. It will motivate you to serve God. That's why you need to come to church, you see that? Or even yeah. fellowship. Just the environment changes you. Yeah. Did you notice that? Didn't the environment of summer camp change you? Yeah. That beats your own bedroom, don't it? Environment of the workplace, 24-7, driving through traffic, seeing sin all around you, smelling marijuana. You think that's going to motivate you to love Jesus Christ and go out soul winning? Come on, preach. That environment, especially when you're stuck in this, that's an environment here. Yeah. You're creating your own world, your own environment. You see this? You really think you'll be motivated to set the world on fire for Jesus Christ after soaking yourself in this environment? Come on, preach. You know why? You change your commitment. Commitment. Your feelings of your flesh combined with the environment. No wonder you change so easily. What should Saul have done? They that hear, blessed are they that hear the word of God and what? Keep it. Keep. You know what changes the feelings of your flesh? Changes the ungodly environment? The Word of God. Yes. Bible reading. Yes. Prayer. Getting in church. Getting in fellowship. Getting to anything Christian or spiritual. Amen. Put yourself, see, in the mood again. Amen. To commit yourself to God. But the reason why you keep changing your commitment is you're not wary of the feelings of your flesh and the environment. Some of you just need to exercise. Yeah. Some of you just need to get away from your own privacy. Some of you need to get away from that poison that's in your workplace, in your family, in your friends, and even, yes, Christians. Some of you need to get away from that and immerse yourself in this book, in a godly environment like this. You, if we had this every single day, do you think you would tend to sin less more, maybe? Let's go back right here. That's the two key. Never forget it. The feelings of your flesh and your environment. Combine that with the devil. Don't you think your life is so hard after that? Those are your three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Come on. That's why you can't stay committed. That's good. All right, going back right here. You know what Samuel says to Saul at verse 26? I will not return to thee. The Lord reject... Because you reject the word of the Lord. Verse 27, Samuel goes away, but Saul holds on to Samuel. Don't leave me, don't leave me. Verse 28, he tears Samuel's robe and Samuel gets upset and said, the Lord rent the kingdom from you. Verse 29, God's not going to repent of that. God's done with you. Verse 30, I've sinned, I've sinned. Well, that's cruel of Samuel. no. You know why Samuel did not, uh, did not restore him? He still kept his idol, his issue. Look at Saul's words at verse 30, after he tore Samuel's cloth. Verse 30, I have sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel. See his problem? His problem was always the people, to be, how I look good in front of the people, how I look good in front of the people. Yeah. That was the true reason why he spared the animals. It's because of the people. He was afraid of them because he wanted to please the people. He wanted yeah. to look like a good politician or a king. It's his ego, his reputation. That's good. Now that was revealed. The idol of his heart was truly revealed when God started to forsake him. You know when your real idol comes out? When God says, I'm done with you. Well, God will restore me, not when you... Yeah, God will restore you, he'll forgive you, but not when you keep clinging on to that idol. You know what the Bible says? No man can serve two masters. Hate the one, love the other. Hold to the one, despise the other. That's why Saul held on Samuel's skirt. Samuel was his idol to make him look good in front of the people. He held to that. He held to that. No, you better reject that, Saul. Yeah. You read Joshua 24? 
As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, Joshua says. And the Jews says, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. And Joshua says, no, you can't serve the Lord because of your idols. And then the Jews said, we will serve the Lord. And the Bible says they committed, they dedicated, we will serve the Lord. Wait, 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 wait. Joshua said, you can't serve the Lord because of your idols. The verse never said they got rid of their idols. You notice that? Joshua 24 shows that they said, we will commit to the Lord, but they didn't get rid of their idol. You know, that's what some of you are doing. Yeah. Your idol. You know why you can't commit to the Lord? There's that idol. I don't know what it is, but you exactly know what it is. You just don't want to be told that. Yeah. Especially if you are told one-on-one with God. You don't want to confront that. It's time to face the reality. Stop pretending it don't exist like Saul. And face the reality. You got an idol and you can't keep that idol while you're serving God. God says, no, I cannot do that. No, I cannot. You, you keep coming on the altar. How can God just forgive you and then wash away your sin and use you if you cling on to that idol in the altar and back with you? Now, I'm not bashing people who keep falling to the same problem after they repented, but that's when they repent of their idol. If you don't give your idol to the Lord, he ain't going to wash that away, forgive it, if you keep clinging on to it. You might say, here's a good example. Isn't this encouraging? A woman, 12 years, an issue, the Bible says, issue. That's deep. That's a long time. She didn't have to hold on to Jesus' skirt to get his attention. She just touched it, and Jesus was willing to look at her and heal her. That's good. I don't care how long your 12 years issue is. Whatever your issue with God is, I don't care how deep it is. As long as you come to him, and all you have to do is touch him. You don't have to hold on to his skirt and beg him to stay. All you have to do is touch. He yeah. will turn every time and heal it. But see, he's healing your issue. What does that mean? Getting rid of your issue. But your problem is you want to keep your issue while holding on to God's skirt and say, oh God, I, I sin, but, but I, need you. I need this issue. I need this. How can God do that? That's why God's like, no, I can't. Face it. And then look at right here, verse 31 through 33. Isn't this sad? Saul worshiped the Lord. You notice that? So if Saul worshiped the Lord, oh, now I better kill that king of Agag, otherwise Samuel's going to get on to me. He didn't. He didn't. If I were him, you know what I would do? After I worship God, I would kill the king of, I would kill King Agag, king of the Amalekites. Do the job. But he didn't. You know who did it? Samuel. Not Saul. Samuel did it. You might say, why is that? Because, see, Saul clung on to his idol. He didn't really repent. He wasn't really sorry. Samuel couldn't trust Saul. So Samuel said, I have to kill Agag for you. You know what's going on right here? There's a Samuel doing your dirty work. There's a Samuel killing the Amalekites for you. Oh, we got a Bible-believing church, you know, that's in the Bay Area, soul-winning, street-preaching, kicking, sin, standing for right doctrine, and... Whoa, 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 whoa. You mean those Samuels, not you, Saul. They're doing your work. They're doing the praying. They're doing the soul-winning. They're doing the fellowship. They're doing everything, not you. But here you are, worshiping the Lord together with them. Yeah. Here you are, Saul, worshiping the Lord together with Samuel on a Sunday main service because that's all you can afford. And here's your Samuel. It could be your brother and sister in Christ. It could be your husband. It could be your wife. It could be your son. It could be your daughter. It could be the pastor. I don't know. But they're doing your dirty work because you can't kill Amalek. You can't kill Agag. They have to kill for you. You know what's sad? You would probably have been dead a long time ago had it not been someone that God put in your life 
That's killing Agag for you. All right. Look at, uh, I mean, Agag at verse 32, he even said, surely the bitterness of death is past. He even knew Saul ain't going to kill me. Last one, verse 34, and I will end it here, 34 and 35. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house to Gebeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. You know what the worst thing is? Verse 1, Saul heard the preaching of the word of God. Verse 34, Saul went back home clinging on to his idol. You know who that is? You. You hear the preaching of the word of God at verse 1, and then verse 34, you're all going to go back home keeping your idol. How do I know Saul kept his idol? How do I know Saul didn't repent? Because verse 35, Samuel was the one mourning for Saul. As a matter of fact, chapter 16, verse 1, God was saying, how long will you mourn for Saul? Samuel was the one mourning, repenting, and weeping over Saul. Saul had no sorrow over his condition, just went back home. That's why I know Saul didn't repent. He just went back home like some people in church. After they hear the word of the Lord, they just go back home. You know what happens after that? I'll tell you what happens. It's amazing, this Bible. It predicts human nature. You know what happens after that? What happens after this, the Bible says, an evil spirit troubles Saul. After he went back home, didn't forsake his idol. Listen, when you go back home, and you know some of you probably are sensing this, when you go back home with your idol, doesn't an evil spirit trouble you? Yeah, and that's why you're the one that keeps saying the devil keeps attacking me pray for me the devil's doing this to me and this to me I wonder why let me predict your future again through the word of God all right and I can speak because I know myself my pattern you know what the next thing happens with Saul after the evil spirit troubled him the evil spirit can only go away when there's a David when David plays that harp, he's the one soothing Saul, taking care of the evil spirit for Saul. That's how Saul survives. You know why you're surviving? There's a David. There's a David that's fighting that evil spirit for you, praying for you, keeping up with you, encouraging you, won't give up on you. That's the only reason you're getting your temporary relief from the evil spirit. Temporary. As long as David is around. But let me predict what will happen in the future. You know what Saul does? That the evil spirit never leaves him. It's only temporary. And no matter how much David played, you know what Saul did? He threw a javelin at David. He got so upset at him and wanted to kill him. You know what's going to happen with some of you? When David is not there to drive that evil spirit away, no matter how well he plays, that evil spirit will trouble you so much, you're going to throw a javelin at your David. Come on. Why? Why? I would never do that. Yeah, no, you would. I've seen it happen in my life and other people's life. You know what happens? It's because that brother and sister was not there for you to encourage you that day. Okay. To follow up with you. To pray for you. To preach at you feel ignored. You feel unwanted. Why? They're not there playing the harp to drive the evil spirit away, you feel like. They are, though. It's just that the evil spirit is too much for you. It's only temporary. You don't think so? Keep up, I guarantee you this, listen. Keep up with your backsliding condition. One day, 
you will get jealous. You will turn against a David in this church one day and leave the church bitter and upset and think that Pastor Kim and Bible Baptist Church, they don't really love me as much because they failed to do this and do that. And you keep blaming David rather than Saul getting your life right with God because of your idol. Why? Because David wasn't there to soothe you of the evil spirit that day. You would soothe my evil spirit if you called me. You would soothe my evil spirit if you were there for me. No, only you can drive out that evil spirit. No matter how much I play you this harp, I'm not going to get rid of that evil spirit for you. Come on. You know what happens next? I'll predict what happens next. You know what Saul did after that? <coughs> Saul, then he had a pity party at chapter 18. He says, why are you all against me? You, you don't understand what I'm going through. Oh, woe is me. It's such a hard life. You know what's going to happen to you after you get upset at a David? You get critical of a David. You criticize David. You gossip about David behind others' back. I'll tell you what happens next. Then you feel sorry for yourself. And you think you're the victim. Come on. Then you know what happens after that? I'll tell you what happens after that. You go to witchcraft, buddy. Yeah. Oh, it may not be witchcraft for you, but it is a real deeper issue that I talked about before. It was laziness after all. Yeah. It was your lust after all. Yeah. It was your sensitivity after all. It was your jealousy after all. That's what happened. It was your forgetfulness after all. That's the deeper issue that lied. How sad. Isn't that scary? So scary. So scary. Aren't you, I don't know about you, but I am scared what I'm capable of doing. Yeah. Do you understand that? Aren't you scared what you're capable of doing? Yeah. Of the evil that can come out that you don't know about in you? Yeah. You are capable of that. How do you end up there? Go back, Saul. It began when you went back home. If Saul didn't go back home, repented right then and there, maybe he would have had a shot, right? Some of you, which stage are you in, Saul? Are you the one that goes back home unrepentant? Can't forsake that idol? Or are you the one where the evil spirit is troubling you right now? Or are you the one where you're getting critical of a David now? Or are you the one that is self-pitying right now? Or are you so lost, you're stuck in your deepest sin issue that you're so blind you can't see it? Come on. That's scary. The scare Let me tell you the scariest thing you can ever do. The scariest thing you can do is back at that last verse of chapter 15, verse 34, is you go back home without getting that idol resolved. The worst thing you can ever do, the scariest thing you can do is not get on this altar, get back home, and keep your idol with you. That is the scariest thing you can ever make in your life. Don't make that mistake. It's not hard, my friend. No matter how deep your issue is, even 12 years, all you have to do is touch Christ, touch the hem. He'll heal it, no matter how deep it is, no matter how long it is. But he ain't going to heal you if you insist on that issue of yours, no matter how much you beg and plead like Saul. I beg you, don't go back home like Saul with your idol. Every head bow and every eye shut.